Good afternoon. Uh, as always, it's nice to be with you. Uh, today, we're going to walk through our typical numbers, uh, share with you what the status is of our COVID-19 data across the state, uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, this upcoming holiday Labor Day and what we can do to really keep going with the gains that we've made, share a little bit of news about our data reporting system, and then spend the bulk of our time talking about our new blueprint for a safer economy, uh, where we know there'll be a number of questions from the press at the end. So to begin, I wanna invite up uh, my colleague, our acting state public health officer, Dr. Erica Pond, to walk through parts of the presentation with you. And uh, it's a real privilege to have her. Her dedication over many weeks has been tremendous and, and uh, really leading the way, working with all of our county leaders and other public health officials across the state. So it's a real privilege to invite Dr. Pong uh, to share some time with you as well. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Galli. Um, it's wonderful to be with all of you this afternoon. So I'll start with uh, our overall trends in case numbers and hospitalizations. I'm happy to share that we continue to see down trends in both cases and hospitalizations. So new cases for today, we have 3,712. Our seven day average is 49.57. And that decrease over the last week has been negative 14%. Of hospitalizations, 38 49 hospitalizations today of COVID uh, patients, and that is down 29 from yesterday. Our weekly trend on that is down by 24%. Uh, we have 1,194 patients in the ICU in California right now, and that is down by 29 compared to yesterday as well. And that weekly decrease is also by 25%. So again, we're really seeing some encouraging trends there that we hope to continue. As far as testing, uh, we can tell you that about 97,000 tests were conducted. Uh, as our daily average recently, and our uh, one-day uh, testing positivity is 4.9%, and our seven-day average is 5.3%. We have 85 new deaths reported today, and our seven-day average for that is 109. So I also really want to uh, be cognizant that this Labor Day is coming up this weekend, and again, as I just shared, we've made some incredible progress together as a state over the last several weeks. And months, and we do not want to lose ground in that progress. So it is not the time to let up our guard. It's time to stay vigilant. And one of the things we really want to make sure we continue to communicate and um, and share with all of you is that our masks are not only protecting each other, but they do protect you as well when you wear these masks. So there's more and more data evolving around this, and we are learning more and more that again, not only does your mask protect you, my mask protects me, and we're all protecting each other as a community by wearing our masks. So this is really the other thing we have to keep doing to keep making this progress. The other thing, again, knowing that we have a three-day weekend coming, we know it's been hard to stay home. The safest thing for you to do is still to stay at home and stay with people you live with. But if you do choose to be with others, please keep it outside. Maintain your physical distance. Keep it small. Make sure it's brief. The longer you're with others, the more risk there is for exposure to COVID-19. And again, make sure you are wearing your mask. And that is our Labor Day message. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pond. Uh, really emphasizing again, the importance of wearing a mask and, and uh, the compelling data that we continue to learn from across the globe and here at home across the states about the impact of having a mask on your face to uh, protect, protect not just the people around you, but yourselves as well. So thank you, Dr. Pond, for emphasizing that and just recognizing that new piece of the message, right? We've been talking so long that it protects others, that it's a civic duty, you support your community, but more and more emphasizing the role that we have in protecting ourselves so we're there and not sick for our families and our communities. Uh, I think is another key piece of that message. Uh, before getting into the blueprint for a safer economy, I wanted to talk a little bit about last week on Wednesday, the governor announced uh, a large uh, move with testing in the state, uh, working with a long partner, Perkin Elmer, uh, to set up a large lab here in California that can manage up to 150,000 
per day of those classic sort of gold standard PCR tests as we watch the continued evolution in the testing world of different types of tests, uh, more rapid tests happening, other modalities, pooled testing, these, these different tools that we believe will keep us informed about transmission and also help support this blueprint for a safer economy and increasing operations of our business sectors. But along with that large number of tests happening in the state, um, we uh, committed to you a few weeks back as we worked through some of the state's data system challenges and getting our data backlogs right, that we would be creating a new standalone COVID data reporting system. And especially as we think about this increased number of tests that the state will see in the months to come, having a robust system is key. So later today, we'll be announcing uh, a contract with Optum Insight, a vendor, to create this new uh, data repository for COVID-19 information so that it uh, can be robust, strong enough, and give us the information that we know we need to manage the pandemic moving forward. That contract's executed now. We hope that in the month of October, it's stood up and ready to go, just as we will be with uh, towards the end of uh, October as well with our uh, work with Brick and Elmer and just our increased testing strategies across the state. So together, these two things, helping support our ability to track transmission and support our communities with valuable information on how to crush the pandemic further. Uh, I wanna spend a little time just reviewing the blueprint for a safer economy. I know it was a lot to take in on Friday. I think in our uh, view, we've created what should be a simpler, more straightforward approach to understanding where a county is and it's sort of march towards beating COVID and meeting different data thresholds and where those business sectors in our communities can expect to operate. I'll remind you that we used to work under the confines of what was the county data monitor list, uh, many more metrics than we have now in the new framework uh, that allowed counties in many ways to have across California 58 different flavors of what it meant to move forward and have our economy begin to operate. What we moved to in the announcement Friday is a framework which went live on Monday, which created four different flavors, four tiers, purple being the most stringent, or red, then orange, then yellow, all based on how a county is performing in two key metrics that you're accustomed to. One is test positivity over a seven day average, as well as daily case rate um, over a seven day average. That case rate number, we're moving to a daily number as opposed to a 14 day average number, in part because that's what much of the rest of the nation and the globe uses as well. So we wanted to stick to metrics that are nationally tracked and validated. Um, so each county on a, every Tuesday will be looking at the data and how counties are performing in those two metrics. Uh, and then assigning a county a different color or tier assignment. I'll remind you that with each tier comes a different level of operations for many different sectors. Some might still remain closed in the tier that your county's in. Others may be fully open. There may be percentage based on occupancy. So some industries might start at 10% open in red, uh, and then move up as a county moves into orange to 25% operations. So uh, all of this is uh, trackable on the covid19.ca.gov website in an easy way to look, not just county by county, but industry by industry in each of those counties. I'll remind you that this is the state's framework, that counties may decide to be more restrictive than the state in certain areas because of issues or different conditions in the county that they know best. Uh, I will just remind you also that we're requiring any county to remain in a tier for at least three weeks. And then before they're able to move to the next tier, the, the next least restrictive tier, they need to meet that next tier's data thresholds 
for two consecutive weeks. So that really is um, sort of demonstrative of our whole goal of being slow and stringent. So we bring transmission rates as low as we can, ensure that as we bring back more sectors in the economy, allow them to have more of their operations back, that we have done what we can to really decrease the transmission, especially as we're knocking on the door of flu season, we're seeing some of the weather changes that we anticipate in the fall, where doing things outdoors isn't as easy as it were before. So really still emphasizing keeping things outdoors, keeping things small, um, all of those very important messages that we've been sharing, applying those to our different economic sectors so we can really get through the fall and winter uh, with a great deal of success and avoid moving back. Speaking of moving back, we also laid out um, clear guidelines for how a county who maybe not only doesn't meet the next year down threshold, but is having a hard time holding on to the current tier that they're in, and they may miss those metric thresholds as well. And if we see that happening for two consecutive weeks, that will lead us into a dialogue with the county public health leaders, other civic leaders there as well, to determine how we make sure we don't see big surges in case numbers, we don't overwhelm the local hospital systems, and if it's required, to move back a tier to make sure that we do all we can to control it. Before opening it up to questions, I wanted to just emphasize schools. Uh, you know, both Dr. Pan and I are pediatricians. We care deeply about getting kids back to schools, but maintain a deep concern at making sure that there are uh, safe environments for all staff and students, teachers, other personnel at schools. So ensuring that we've created a pathway as we committed to on July 19th, when we put out our school guidance, that two things still main, maintain, that even though we've moved to a new framework, we're allowing counties that met the 14-day threshold before we put this new framework into place, where they were off of the county data monitoring list, our old framework, uh, for 14 days to continue moving forward with their school reopenings if, the um, labor agreements were all in place in that county and they had plans in place to do that. For counties that didn't quite meet that threshold, but move into the red tier from the purple tier, once, around, once they're in the red tier, they have to wait those 14 days, those two weeks before schools can move forward and begin plans for reopening, if that is the will of the county um, in, in a way. The waiver for the K through six opportunity that we talked about back uh, in late July with schools, that still maintains. So counties in the purple tier who have essentially a case rate, a daily case rate of between seven and 14, which equals the 100 per 100,000 for 14 days or 200 per 100,000 for 14 days of the county data monitoring frame, that seven to 14 range um, also can apply if it is the agreement among the public health team in a county, the district leadership, schools, and um, parents and other stakeholders to move forward with that waiver application, but that can also be applied for at the state level. So really, as, as it relates to school, uh, did all that we can to maintain the same um, set of conditions and construct that we had under county data monitoring because we know such tremendous work has been put in place to create plans to potentially bring some students and counties back to in-person learning. So before we wrap up and move on to questions, I just wanted to pick up on what Dr. Pond mentioned as we move forward into another holiday weekend and we look back at the summer and we see some of the critical moments that we had as a state to really maintain and reduce transmission. I think about Labor Day and I think about our lifting up our laborers across the state and people who are part of our essential workforce and our workforce in general. And what more can we do to celebrate work but to make sure that workers are protected? And wearing that mask, making sure that as we gather uh, potentially with some people outside of our household, that we really do all of the things that Dr. Pond reminded us of 
to keep it small and keep it outside. So wear your mask, the physical distance of six feet, the washing your hand, and being cognizant as we enter the fall and winter and many of the common viruses that cause the common cold start to, to come alive a bit more. That if, uh, if you have symptoms that look like the common cold, often those are the same ones that we see with COVID. Um, please stay home. Please make sure that you're keeping your distance from those who aren't sick, that you haven't been around. So we reduce transmission and we don't see the surges that we saw over the summer in cases. Um, our standard reminder, we appreciate all 40 million Californians really working together to keep our transmission numbers coming down to protect our hospitals as we prepare for the fall and winter. And so with that, I'll turn it um, over and uh, take any questions that reporters have. Bill Willen, the Los Angeles Times. Um, hi, Doctor. I hope you're doing well. Thanks, um, Bill. What is the scientific basis for the new metrics uh, that you, for the reopening of counties? I mean, for instance, why, the, why must they hit the numbers for two weeks and not one week or three weeks? Why four to seven new cases per 100,000 to be in the red tier and not five to seven or three to seven? Why positivity rates and not hospitalizations? Or is that based on a model that you saw or the state has seen in another country or state? Or is it based on scientific studies? Or did you create this from scratch? Yeah, uh, Phil, we're, we're, we've been uh, looking across the nation, across the globe, frankly, at countries that have been successful with curtailing transmission, states that have themselves done their own reopening plan, and looked at a number of national leaders who are talking about which metrics give us the best sense early enough that they're not the most lagging indicators. So you asked about hospitalizations. We know that our hospital numbers um, have been strong and accurate, but they are um, somewhat lagging indicators. Uh, and so we wanted to identify metrics that I think have some national traction, that people understand, that we can measure reliably, and to try to keep it simple. We chose just two that are um, early to medium indicators of what disease transmission looks like. We also um, built these around uh, things that aren't necessarily some of the earliest indicators, but incorporate those. It incorporates aspects of the ability to do your disease investigation and contact tracing and support of isolation. It incorporates within these two metrics details around testing and testing capacity within a county. So we thought that these two, and, and it wasn't just what we thought, we tested them with uh, many, many county local health leaders as well as national leaders to really validate this approach. Um, the ranges that we selected were based also on uh, a bit of what we've learned from the past, working with other state leaders as well. And we wanted to create a setting where uh, that we, we allowed improvement within the range before moving on to the next uh, tier. Also, we're, we believe that one of the lessons we learned in our earlier reopening experience was that two weeks wasn't enough. That it took at least two weeks, one sort of complete incubation cycle, plus a little bit more time to see the impact of any change that you made. And so we really wanted to stick to three weeks and, and frankly, that's the minimum. We think that uh, some counties may spend even longer in a tier as we see the impact of some of the changes that they make. And the two weeks of consecutive data to meet the next tier uh, threshold, uh, the, the next uh, less restrictive tier was there to make sure that we had consistent data over a period of time of at least two reporting periods. Remember, we're gonna be tracking this data and reporting it every Tuesday. So we wanted two consecutive Tuesdays looking over a 14 day period to ensure that the county really did stabilize metrics to meet the next year. So again, all of these um, concepts and uh, approaches emanate from this notion of slow and stringent is really gonna carry us forward so we don't end up having to move back later. David Baker, Bloomberg News. Yes, I want to 
go back to the outbreak that we saw starting, I think, probably about a month ago in the Central Valley. I wanted to see if you folks had any clear idea as to the source or sources of that outbreak, and if you could sort of bring us up to date on how things are going in the Valley now. And then sort of connected with that, um, not to be terribly pessimistic, but are we in, going to be in a situation in the months ahead where we have uh, you know, outbreaks getting under control in places like L.A. County only to pop up elsewhere at the state and just constantly have to play whack-a-mole with it? Yeah, I mean, both, both good questions. We plan to share a little bit more about Central Valley in the week to come, so I'll be brief here to answer your question. Um, we have seen a number of outbreaks in some of our essential workplaces, large factories, large farms, um, really working with our community partners and public health partners, discovering that really the penetration of the messaging in, in Spanish and in other languages spoken in the Central Valley uh, needed to be increased so that we could get the message around masking. I mean, it's great to be able to share the evolving evidence around masking and physical distancing in English with many of you, but then being able to share that locally in, uh, in Spanish in the Central Valley is also key. We also have learned that despite efforts to really increase our uh, reporting of race and ethnicity around COVID-19 data, testing, cases, hospitalizations, that we still nearly see 30% of our cases without that information. You speak to some of the Central Valley health officers and leaders, we learn that those cases that don't have the race and ethnicity data um, uh, on the case actually have Latino surnames. So um, really focusing not just on the Central Valley as a geography, but really working with our Latino communities to increase our messaging, make sure that things like cloth face coverings are available to people working out on the farms and in the fields where it gets hot and it's not always comfortable to wear an N95 mask or a surgical mask. So really creating some efforts with the communities in the Central Valley to address where we believe the outbreaks were occurring and to really address um, those opportunities to not just reduce transmission now, but to really set us up for a future where we'll see reduced transmission moving forward. The second part of the strategy in the Central Valley which has been successful just as it was with Imperial Valley, was working to increase the capacity within the hospitals, making sure that staffing was robust, that we had testing for staffing so that staff, so that they didn't need to be out of, uh, out of the hospital settings or the clinic settings longer than necessary, and to ensure that we had um, not just testing, but other important supplies and space to be able to manage the number of patients. And we've done that now, both in Imperial Valley or in Imperial County, uh, in parts of the Central Valley, and really have built that up moving forward as a key part of our response. As you mentioned, um, yes, I mean, California's counties have different experiences with COVID. In one area, you've seen a surge two months ago, and now some reduction in cases. And then in other counties, you see some increases. Uh, we are continuing to, to learn how to address this broad geography and the response around COVID-19, working with our local partners to address those. And I'm sure we'll have some counties that experience increased transmission in the months to come. We feel better equipped um, than earlier in the summer and certainly the spring to address those. So even though we're going to see some occasional increase in transmission, we feel working with our local partners that we can um, curtail that and really be prepared as we have been in the healthcare delivery system to serve anyone who becomes sick enough to need that level of care. Paul Sisson, the San Diego Union Tribune. Thanks for taking my call. I had a couple questions for you here. They're, they're kind of small details. Um, first off, where and when will the state post its metrics update, which I believe is coming today, as today is Tuesday, um, second. Um, there has been some, some confusion down here in San Diego about the 50% capacity requirements for retail and grocery stores. We've seen 
some enforcing those capacity limits and others not. Uh, can the state confirm that those are truly in effect at this point? Uh, and third, there's been some criticism about the uh, least restrictive tier of the four tiers that were announced uh, earlier this week. That would be tier one, uh, which calls for one case per 100,000 uh, per day uh, to be in that tier. Some have said that uh, this is a level that's so low that, that just the uh, false positive rates of the PCR tests that are being used would be enough to make it impossible to actually achieve that tier. So those are my questions. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, first, uh, in, in the governor's presentation on Friday, we announced that we will be updating the metrics every Tuesday. We announced that the next update will actually happen next Tuesday, the 8th of September. So we went from Friday and the announcement, implementing Monday, and then waiting eight days, so till the next Tuesday, the 8th, um, so a week from today when we will update those tiers. So there's no new tiering update today. We've been working with all the counties over the weekend, who had questions on how they were assigned to that tier, making sure that the data, data was accurate, had some adjustments that, that were made, and now anticipate moving forward next Tuesday announcing new tiers. Um, with regards to the retail sectors, uh, indeed, grocery stores continue to have a 50% occupancy uh, uh, requirement in, in uh, the purple tier, and the rest of retail is at 25%, and that includes retail in malls. So, uh, you know, that is the, uh, the uh, allowance within the purple tier. Um, of course, enforcement in all of these areas requires local partnership working together with our business sectors. So I, I think that those, those issues are uh, enforceable and we hope that as we work with the business community and frankly all of you citizens as patrons that we watch out and we make sure that, that those are um, adhered to so we can continue to move forward without risking increased transmissions. As far as the metric cutoffs, you know, we, we do know that getting to the least restrictive tier requires quite a bit of reduction in transmission. Um, we believe that it is not impossible. In fact, we have some counties that have had very low, if you know, almost no transmission initially start in that yellow tier. For large counties, these are gonna be challenges, but at the same time, they indicate a level of transmission where a lot of the sectors can operate at a high level of occupancy without the fear that we're gonna have an outbreak or a major source of transmission. So uh, we've, we've worked hard to make these, uh, these tiers uh, uh, you know, have large ranges and at the top tier and the lowest tier or the, the most restrictive and the least restrictive tier, indeed, uh, you, you know, they, they have some uh, you know, stringent requirements that we want to see in order to advance uh, forward our state uh, with our strong public health and economic health in mind. Fiona Keller, the Mercury News. Hi, Dr. Daly. Um, so here in the Bay Area, some local officials are closing down beaches in anticipation of uh, Labor Day crowds. Um, but epidemiologists are obviously worried about uh, larger threats indoors with family and friends gatherings and have said that they're concerned um, that shutting down public spaces could cause people to gather inside. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the extent to which it's useful to kind of do a blanket closure of public spaces like beaches at this point as opposed to say focusing the message more on um, indoor gatherings. Thanks. Yeah. I think uh, two things come to mind. First, thank you for the question. It's always great to have an uh, opportunity to reiterate what I think is one of the top line messages for the day, which is let's plan for a safe and um, low transmission Labor Day. I think we, uh, we had Memorial Day, we had the 4th of July. This is the third sort of summer holiday that we really want to do a great job on as a state. So. Uh, beaches, other outdoor spaces, uh, I think local conditions are going to drive what happens in some of those counties and in those outdoor spaces particularly. I don't want to speak to what is going into every county's determination as to what, what outdoor spaces 
are restricted or altogether closed. But I will endorse the point that you've made, which is we want, we have so much good information about how ventilation and the outdoor space reduces transmission um, that we encourage people to have small, small experiences that are short and outside that um, if the decision because of a beach closure is to bring uh, a small gathering indoors, we know that that is going to create a more risky environment for transmission and would encourage people as much as possible to take it outside, keep it brief, and always wear your mask during, during those experiences. So um, both want to acknowledge that local conditions drive decisions um, around these specific closures and maybe there's something that, that I don't have at my disposal that's driving that decision, but certainly being outdoors is a lower risk environment than being inside, not just this weekend, but on any weekend and for any different gathering. Claudia Pesuera, KNX Radio. Hi, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first uh, is uh, the governor talked about being more stubborn on coronavirus reopening requirements now. Do you think it was a mistake for the state to ignore the earlier standards and proceed with reopening, especially given the surge that we saw in July? The second question is regarding uh, homeless people. LA County has seen a big jump in homeless deaths. San Francisco reportedly has as well. Are you concerned about this? I'm um, wondering if the state is looking into it or taking any action. And do you think all homeless people who die should be tested for COVID? Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, a few questions. I'll try to answer them as well as I can. Uh, regarding your first, and the, the gover governor uses uh, the word stubborn. Uh, we use, I use the word stringent. I think it's really a commitment to being patient with how we move forward here. And we learned a lot in the months of April, May, June, and July. We learned that it's a lot about how you do things and not just when you do things. And the how was being patient, having enough time between changes to allow us to see the impact of those changes actually manifest in the data, whether it's cases or hospitalizations, and making sure that we, this, with this framework, um, look at not just open and close as two different things, but degrees of opening, that having 10% operations is different than 25 or 50, and that as transmission comes down, that we have an opportunity to introduce those changes in a gradual way after seeing the impact of the first change before adopting the next one. So in many ways, I think, the strategy and the framework that we put out um, on Friday really builds upon what uh, was going on at the late spring and early summer with opening. But I can't emphasize enough that guidelines are guidelines. Tiering is tiering, but it requires all of us to do our part. And um, that's why we focus on Labor Day a bit. Uh, this is an opportunity for us either to together lose some of the gains that we've made or together really reinforce those gains by doing some of the things. So whether it's you're going into an indoor restaurant with 25% occupancy because you're in the red, you're in a county in the red tier, wear your mask, you know, sit at a table far enough away from others that you don't know and don't interact with. Um, do the courteous thing and put your mask on when your server comes to the table. Support each other by really choosing a different how than we did in the earlier parts of our response. And I think that's gonna take us a long way. Um, with regards to uh, homeless individuals as it relates to COVID, absolutely, we've been concerned early on. I think back to the first days of our response and really thinking about vulnerable populations in a way that I think was, was um, really the way California thinks about a lot of our vulnerable populations, protecting seniors, older Californians, those with underlying conditions, and those with, who are homeless or housing insecure, where it becomes really hard to do normal activities and not, um, not reduce your risk around COVID. So uh, I think as a state, uh, the response with 
project room key and now home key and the real focus on moving individuals indoors who maybe were encampments or sleeping on the streets and supporting shelters to create some semblance of physical distancing to protect the most vulnerable has really supported, but we have not totally, uh, totally escaped some of the worst outcomes with our homeless residents and those experiencing homelessness across the state. So really trying to understand uh, those who are sick, making sure that testing is not just available, but that we have quick turnaround so we can act and doing the contact tracing among uh, our residents experiencing homelessness, all key strategies that I know many counties uh, are doing a tremendous job on. And we will continue not just asking questions of should we test uh, every individual who's passed away who's homeless for COVID, but also trying to be more upstream with our interventions and supporting people to get off, a, get, get off the streets if possible into permanent supportive housing if it's available and making sure all the wraparound services to uh, reduce COVID transmission are available to those who are most vulnerable, including those facing homelessness across the state. Catherine Ho, San Francisco Chronicle. Hi, Dr. Gowie. Um, I have a few related questions about the new COVID data reporting system. Um, is that going to replace CalReady, or is it just going to break off COVID from the rest of the infectious diseases reported to CalReady? Is that the same optum that's doing the um, test specimen collection? And lastly, what steps are you taking to make sure that the new system doesn't have the same problem uh, with COVID that the CalReady system had? Thank you. Yeah, all excellent questions. Thank you for, for asking them. So first off, Optum Insight is not Optum Serve. Optum Serve is our partner doing some of the statewide uh, uh, testing or collection sites across the state. Uh, Optum Insight is a separate uh, separate uh, organization company that we have contracted for this standalone COVID reporting system that will run parallel to CalReady. It will Yes, offload CalReady from all of the COVID related data. I'll remind you that hundreds, maybe a couple thousands of tests a day feed into CalReady before COVID. Now we've uh, put a workload on CalReady that was never imagined. This system is built to really handle that high volume of test results, both negatives and positives. It also gives us a chance to be ro more robust. I I'm really uh, please that we have with Perkin Elmer uh, uh, testing or a uh, lab that will allow us to collect more and richer information and feed that into the no, new COVID data reporting system. So hopefully we close some of the information gaps that we have on demographic information, sexual orientation, gender identity push, all of this information, whether somebody is working in a healthcare environment, a different essential workplace. So really enhancing the state's ability to not just see where transmission is happening, but to understand some of the more detailed nuanced pieces in it. Um, uh, I think those were uh, the, the primary questions you asked. If I missed one, please let us know later and we'll try to answer that as well. Answer Custodia, the voice of OC. Hi, Dr. Gowdy, thanks for taking our question. Mine specifically about Orange County. Uh, under the new tiered system, it looks like the county is uh, doing better than what's showing, or, you know, doing better than the tier it's on, um, you know, below the, the two key metrics, the uh, tests or the number of positive people per 100,000 and the positivity rate, uh, so 5.6 per 100,000 and a 5% positivity rate, according to the state um, dashboard monitoring this. My question is, um, how did Orange County get on the purple list? And, you know, in the upcoming assessment next week on Tuesday, is there any chance it could move off or will it have to stay there for yeah. um, a couple more weeks? Great question, thank you. It allows me to illustrate uh, uh, how the tiering worked this first time. And the first uh, sort of assignment really looked back at two weeks prior to our announcement. So we looked back at the data uh, the week of the uh, August 11th to the 7th through the 17th, and then 
uh, the week of the 18th as well, and looking at both of those weeks and determining how each county uh, would be assigned to a tier uh, using that data. And in the case of some counties, they met the criteria for one tier in the first week and then a different tier in the second. And following the whole concept of meeting the criteria for two consecutive weeks to move to the next tier, in the case of Orange and some other counties, they met purple in the first week, orange in the second, so they were ultimately initially assigned purple. But to your second part of your question, indeed, in the next time we run the data next Tuesday, if a county that has met the requirement to move tiers uh, uh, to, to of the next tier for one week, they indeed, if they meet it again, they would then move into the red tier in this case. So yes, the next week, uh, I think some counties will be wondering whether they are meeting it for the first time, the second time, or in the case that we've seen increased transmission in a county, they may miss the mark after meeting it once and therefore stay in the purple tier. Uh, so yes, indeed, there is opportunities as soon as next week's next week for some counties to move from purple to red. Any county in the red um, will remain, any county in red, orange, or yellow, well, yellow, they'll stay there, hopefully uh, continue the gains that they have and not see uh, increased transmission, but in red or orange, they will stay for at least three weeks as I, I described earlier. Final question, Ashley Zavala, Cron 4. Hi, Dr. Yelly. I just have a quick question. I know I saw that today um, the administration was supposed to release uh, health equity benchmarks uh, for counties in addition to daily case rate and test positivity rates. Is that still the plan? Were you going to do that? Was the governor going to do that? So, Ashley, thank you for the question. Our intent is to get a health equity measure and just remind people that we chose two really uh, uh, what we think are tried and true metrics around epidemiology and test positivity and in the daily case rate. Because uh, California is focused on equity, because so many of our uh, disproportionately impacted populations work in some, many of the business sectors that are beginning to see increased numbers of patrons come and thereby increasing potential exposure risk for those essential workers that have been disproportionately impacted. It has been an important part of our entire framework to focus on equity. Adding an equity measure is our intention. We had hoped that we would have it solidified for today and that I could share it with you. We aren't quite there yet. We wanna make sure that we get good uh, input from not just our state and county partners, but also from many community partners who have been um, working with us all along on decreasing disparities and focusing on equity. I will say that we have looked nationally and internationally at potential um, equity concepts and there aren't very many that are really anchored around data and um, moving towards closing disparities. There's plenty of states that um, like us really declare the interest in focusing on equity, but I think we'll be certainly one of the first states to really put down a, a, a measure around how counties are doing on focusing on equity, whether that comes in the form of focusing on testing and contact tracing and isolation or one of the other metrics. So stay tuned. Uh, we wanna make sure that we have it be uh, really up to the task here in California. So just a little bit more time before we're able to announce that measure. So with that, I just wanna thank you all for tuning in. I know there's a lot of questions on the framework uh, we hope to continue answering them, working with your local leaders and your counties to make sure there's no questions that the path forward is as clear as it can be and that we are slow and stringent as we move forward. So we make sure that we keep, uh, keep the improvement going and that we don't through the fall and winter when we see flu, when we see some of the increase, potential increased transmission because of wildfires and evacuations that we've done all we can to protect Californians and that we can get through this together and actually crush COVID-19 once and for all. Thank you.